Hey guys, how you doing? It's Ty here. I figured I would come to you tonight with a Bible study. I have uh, something on my heart. Yeah, so I wanted to go ahead and uh, talk tonight about the power of God. So God's power is actually um, one of the most amazing things that we have as Christians. One of the most, uh, one of the greatest things we have to treasure is the pa- the fact that God has given us power. Now, um, a lot of times power gets uh, misconstrued, right? So last time when we did a Bible study, my uh, Danielle, my wife, was with us, and uh, she was talking about, um, you know, we were talking about how to we know God, and she was basically talking about reading that scripture to us, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And so as I started thinking about that and, and re- really just letting that kind of just churn in my heart this last week, um, I just started realizing that, man, we, we don't really understand sometimes what God's power is for. And so I wanted to go ahead and make this Bible study. Um, and like I said, we're going to try and do this once a week, twice a week. We have some people as we've been going out and doing some street preaching that um, have really reached out and said, dude, Ty, could you, know, could you give me your opinion on this? Could you show us what the word says about this? Could you show us what the word says about that? And so uh, I'll tell you this. I won't give my opinion. I don't like giving my opinion um, because... Um, unless I feel strongly that I should, I, I, I won't, I try to just give the word of God because I know that, um, my opinion can, is from man and, uh, but God's word is true. And then when we come to the place of understanding and knowing who God is, what is his power for? Why God's power? So I made this little presentation. I hope you like it. It's called the power of God. And basically, um, it, it just, just is why we have it, uh, have God's power and why we need it. Um, so, you know, the, the most important part of the, uh, the puzzle is firstly why we have God's power. And then we also know that we need it. Actually, I think it's reversed. Why do we need it first? And then why do we have it? And so it's so powerful because, you know, Jesus, um, he came, he died on the cross. He, yeah, he rose again. He defeated death in the grave. And then um, what makes it even more beautiful is he, he, when he rises again and goes up to heaven with the father, he says, I'm sending you a helper and I'm sending you someone who's going to convict the earth of righteousness and judgment. He says, I'm, I'm sending a helper. Now, I don't know if you know, but um, you know, when God, when God sends something, I want to receive it. I want to receive it. And so we need to find out what is God's power for and why does it exist? And so, um, so the first thing I want to try and talk about is why we have God's power and then why we need it. Cause I think the most, most important one is we need it. So a lot of people have misconceptions about God's power. They, they think that, you know, God's power is found at a revival service, you know, People say, come to a revival service and receive the great and awesome power of God, <laughs> you know, but is that really the truth? Is that really the power of God? Because don't get me wrong. Are miracles powerful? Yes, they are. Are signs and wonders powerful? Yes, they are. They're very powerful. But we tend to get really wrapped up in that stuff, don't we? We tend to get very, very closed minded when it comes to what God's power is about. So my hope is that as we study together, that you're going to be able to see what God's power is not only um, why well, not only why we have it, but why we need it in our lives as we move forward with the Lord. So the first one, let's go to uh, Philippians three ten and read, read that same verse that we read last week that Danielle was reading to us. It is I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and the participation in His sufferings becoming like him in his death. So you see that I need, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Now, what does that mean? The power of his resurrection. See, this was all that Paul, the apostle was after when he ran the race. He was, he was after this, but we have to realize that 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 is a, a closed statement, the power of his resurrection, Right. So it's not just his power, but it's the power of his resurrection. So the Bible says we've been become dead to sin. So when you get baptized, like think about this as a person, my hand, when you get baptized, you become dead to sin. 
and you are raised up in the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? That means that you're now alive to Christ, that you may know him. Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So my, my, big, um, my big issue with a way that people misconstrue God's power is that they think that God's power is something that they're going to experience at a church service or something that they're going to experience, you know, uh, here, there, or the next place. But the reality is God's power is the very thing that helps you overcome sin. It's the very thing that helps you be the kind of person that the Lord, the Lord desires you to be uh, as you transition from this life to the next. And it just reminds me of a story. You know, one time I was speaking with a friend of mine and he always said to me, dude, can you imagine what it would look like uh, to go to heaven? And I was like, you know, that, that's, that's awesome. It's a, great, it's a great thought what it would look like to go to heaven. But I wonder if, you know, through this life, um, God is giving us an opportunity to know him just like Enoch did and walk with God. And I remember saying to my friend that day, I said, you know, is, I wonder if it's possible for us to know God to such a place where heaven just seems like the logical next step. Heaven just seems like the next thing. Like, imagine if you just go, the Bible says we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. We go step by step by step with the Lord. And as we're stepping higher and higher and higher, the Bible says that, that your kingdom come. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So my point is, imagine if you got to know God in the place where heaven just seemed like the logical next step to your relationship. You see, that's the kind of relationship God is offering here on earth. And I, I'll be honest with you, that excites us more than anything, it excites me more than anything to know that, listen, I don't have to sit here suffering um, uh, in vain, but in those sufferings, I get to know him. Like it says that in that second part of that verse, it says, and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have to be, become like him in death. Paul, the apostle, said these words in the Bible. He said, I die daily. Every day I die. I die to my flesh, to my wants, my desires. Every single thing that I do, I die to it every single day. And why do we have to have the participation of his sufferings? Well, the Bible says, count it all joy when you face all kinds of trials and tribulations, for you know that your suffering produces perseverance. And the perseverance produces hope, and the hope does not disappoint. Do you know that the way that you know God, you know, and look at Paul the Apostle, when he came to the end of his life, what did he say? I've run the race, and I've finished the course. I finished the race that God marked out for me. And then he goes on to say, now you run the race and run to win. Don't run. Nobody runs a race mediocre, right? Some people are going to just make it and they're just going to say like, you know, I die on my deathbed. I, I just had real repentance before the Lord. But Paul says, no, run the race marked out, run to win. And that's what we're talking about tonight is that power of his resurrection and the participating participation of his sufferings. So let's keep going here on this in this uh, in these scriptures. So Acts 1, 7 and 8 says, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the father has set by his own authority. But you, right, this is Jesus, right? Right before he raises, he's, he's, he's risen, he's ascending uh, to heaven. This is right before that takes place. He says, they asked him the question. This is what the disciples said to him, just to give you some context. They said, uh, Lord, you know, when are you going to restore the, 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 uh, the nation of Israel? Like, you know, when are you going to restore the kingdom back to us, God? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the father has set by his own authority. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now watch this. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
So here's my question is, you know, when, when again, we're talking about power now, again, um, you know, as a, as a young believer, you know, I was really taught that the power of God was, you know, like when a guest speaker came to our church or when, uh, when something else would take, would take place and something really powerful a blind man would see it. And yes, is it powerful when miracles happen? Absolutely. But I'm going to show you here later on in this stream uh, tonight that, uh, you know, that miracles can actually be somewhat deceiving when it comes to the power of God. And that's why we're talking about the real power tonight. You see, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and season and date, but he's trying to get them on, get their eye on the prize. This is guys, listen, I'm going to restore the kingdom, but I don't want your focus to be on the kingdom of, of physical Israel right now. I want you to shift your attention to, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my, what is that? Witnesses in all Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we see here that in this verse, Acts 1, verse 7 and 8, Jesus saying, you will receive power. And what happens after you receive the power? You become a witness. So in the verse prior to this, we saw that Jesus is saying, um, you know, uh, that, that, that Paul was saying that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the sufferings. So we know that God's power is there for us to overcome those sufferings and, and to, to die daily to ourselves and to live for Christ every day. Uh, but then we also see here that, um, you know, that here where the power comes on the disciples and it comes on us, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So here's my thing is if you really believe um, that you have the power of God in your heart, it doesn't require you to uh, raise someone from the dead tomorrow. It does require you, though, to be a witness. And that doesn't mean that you don't, you're not going to have that, that moment in your life where you do, a, you know, pray over someone and they do get healed and all those things. It just means that sometimes our eyes are on the wrong prize. We want to see this happen. In fact, there's, uh, there's some scriptures, and I'm going to read to you later, that show you how Jesus told us to take our eyes off of those things. He said, you know, these things will happen. You, know, you, you, will, you will do these things. You will drive out demons. You will, you will heal, you know, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. But he said, but don't put your eyes on that. Don't put your eyes on that. You know, the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. I wonder if you are seeking signs in your life. I wonder if you are seeking the signs or, or are, are you doing something way different than that, which is, are you actually participating with the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit and becoming a real witness. Because you see, when you become a witness, the Bible says signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. So when I go out and I witness and I preach God's word, there is power that takes place. I want to tell you a story. Um, I was actually street preaching at the, at, uh, the beaches. I'll actually be doing it again this week, probably tomorrow night. I'll be at, at, at Jack's beach or, um, some of the guys from Untamed Truth will be there. But as we go to the, the, the bars, we were there the other night and we were standing there and these two Muslim guys walk up to us and we start having a conversation with them about God. And God just starts giving myself and Naeem just a mat, immense, immense, great ability when it comes to explaining the gospel to these uh, Muslim guys. And I, you know, I turn around and I I, uh, for some reason, there's this guy in a wheelchair and the Lord says to me, now prophesy to this guy in the wheelchair. And I, I turn to him and I, and I say, the Lord says, and I, and I just, <laughs> I just prophesy straight to him. And I say, Hey, you know, uh, the Lord says that you've been looking for him through the logos word, but he wants to reveal the rhema word to you. And, and he just, he just throws his hands up and he says, this word is for me. You don't know. You have no idea what I asked God for today. And the two Muslim guys are looking at each other. <laughs> And they're looking and they're going, uh, like, what? Are you serious? This is happening. And then right as I start prophesying to this guy, right next to him, another guy who's standing right next to him, who's, who's a homeless man, who has a, a big bag. He's carrying a massive bag with him. He literally reaches into his bag and says, I feel so convicted right now. I feel the conviction of the Lord on my heart. 
and he grabs this $35 bottle. I wish I had it on live stream. I would have showed you guys. It, he grabs a $35 bottle of rum and starts pouring that bottle right out on the ground and saying, I don't need any more idols in my life. And you see, like, that's the thing that I'll be honest with you. Um, it excites me way more than, than if some, than if someone were to receive their sight. Um, even though I love, I love healing, I love healing, but it excites me way more to see that people are getting convicted of their sin because when, when the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, it means that people are getting prepared for heaven. How many of you guys know that you can be healed today? I know a lot of people that were healed 10 years ago in some conference and today they're backslidden and they don't serve God. You know, it's much more important, guys, for us to realize why the power of God is upon us. And it's to be a witness to what Jesus has done in our lives. It's much more powerful for us to stand before people and say, God is real. God is true. And he's given, me the, he's given us the power to overcome sin. And so I'll tell you today that uh, this verse is, is, is something that's inspiring me because I realize how much God really wants us to be his witnesses. And that's the reason he gives us his power. Now let's go to another verse here. So Luke 10, chapter 18, verse 20, it says, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority, power, that word again, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. So we are also given the power of God. You see in this verse here in Luke, Jesus is telling uh, his disciples, he's empowering them. And he's also saying that there is a power. There's another power. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against powers and principalities and rulers of this dark age. So you got to realize that there's the power that has been given to the enemy. The only power that the enemy has over you is the power that you let him have by not knowing your authority that Jesus gave, gives you right here in Luke 10. He says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes. That's the same, the same reference to the garden, right? To trample on the snakes where, where the Lord says to the snake in the garden, he says to the devil in the garden, that this uh, Adam will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel because we trample on the enemy. That's what the Bible says. He's given us authority. And then he says, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. So our power is greater. Actually, the Bible goes as far as to say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Talking about Satan. That doesn't mean that Satan doesn't have power. It just means that greater is the power in you. And that's what you have to realize is when you go out and you witness, when you go out and you do God's will, and when you follow God, despite anything else, um, God will give you victory because you have the power to, again, what's that word? Overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice. Now watch this part right here. Verse 20. This is why I included this verse. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, I wonder, is, again, you know, people, they, they, fall, they, they try to follow. And this is where a lot of people have fallen off the bandwagon. There's a lot of people preaching truth. There's a lot of people preaching spirit. But the Bible says that you have to, they that worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth, both. The Bible says a man of wisdom doesn't lean from one extreme without holding on to the other, right? You have to balance yourself. When I say balance, don't balance with sin and righteousness. Don't do that. <laughs> balance with the, the, the spirit and the truth. There's a lot of people out there that say that there's no more. Uh, God doesn't heal anymore. That, that, that uh, the gifts of the spirit are no longer in operation. Um, that, you, that no prophecy is no longer a thing. And they, they, they love the Bible. And I would say to them, well, you know what? You obviously lean too hard on the truth. When I say too hard, you can't lean too hard on God's word. But what I'm saying is they lean too lopsided. 
Because the Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit brings it to life. Now, I'll tell you right now, if you don't understand that verse, you, you'll go to the letter, which is the Bible. You'd open it up and you just read it and you, would, you wouldn't know the context. You wouldn't let the Holy Spirit interpret it for you. And you would just say, well, this is what I'm doing. And you would do it. <laughs> well, that's problematic. Um, it's really problematic. And the reason why is because you can get misled without being led by the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say? Does it say the Bible will teach you all things? Or does it say the Holy Spirit will teach you all things? It says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. But the Holy Spirit does not teach us anything apart from the word. That's why we need both, guys. So you see here how Jesus is saying, do not rejoice when spirits submit to you. So, you know, we have these opportunities to get into a lot of pride and a lot of excitement when we see that someone was demonically possessed. And I've had this happen many times where I see someone who's, who's you know, manifesting under the demonic. And I will say to them, you know, um, in Jesus name, come out in Jesus name, come out. And, and well, I'll say, stop. Yeah, if you watch some of my previous videos, uh, you'll see that when I was uh, rebuking um, some of the, the Buffalo Bills that were so full of pride the night before they lost to the Jaguars, which which is something that, you know, I said to the one guy, I said, dude, what what happens if you lose, man? Are you going to be this prideful? But regardless, this guy walked out. He was completely drunk. He was bleeding from his nose. He was bleeding from his teeth. He grabs me by the neck, grabs me by the neck like this. I'm just looking at him and I'm thinking, Lord, what am I going to do with this guy? And I, I just looked at him and I said, um, man, I, I, uh, I, sir, what's going on? He said, I'm, I'm in pain. You have no idea what's happened to me tonight. I need Jesus. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, nah, he's still He's still, that's not him. That's not, that's, that's a, that's a demon. And so he's freaking out. He's grabbing me on the neck. He's doing this in my body. And finally, I just put my hand on his head and I just said, in Jesus name, calm down. <laughs> and he goes, you can watch it on the video. He goes, okay. And he just calmed down. <laughs> and you see, the Bible says we have authority. He says that the spirits submit to you. Right. But I'm not rejoicing about that. You know what I rejoice about? That my name is written in heaven. You see, it's it's that the signs and wonders follow. I get to tell you these stories because these are the things that happen while I'm still working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And you are, too. And so when you share a great testimony of something that God has done, it shouldn't spur someone else on to go out there and try to make God do magic tricks. What it should do which it should spur someone else on to love God more and to have their name written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't that beautiful? That the power of God is given to us so that we can, we will see signs and wonders, but it's not for that purpose. It's for overcoming. It's for trampling on the snakes and overcoming the power of the enemy. And that means overcoming sin, overcoming uh, the, the, the attacks, overcoming the trials and tribulations, overcoming the, uh, the hardships and the sufferings, God, that we have God's grace to overcome all of those things. And while we are having the power of God to be witnesses, we rejoice that our names are written in heaven. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful scripture about God's power here. So let's look through here. Jesus goes on here. And he's talking about what will happen in the last days. When people come to God, they're going to have a confusion with what God's power really is about, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So what, what's the key? If we, go, if we were to go back, to the verse prior to this, we'd see that the key here is what Jesus said. He said, don't, don't find it great when you when you have, when these spirits submit to you, but be glad and be happy that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life or that you, that your names are written in heaven. That's what you should take joy in. Then he says here, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter my kingdom. Then he says, 
but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So we see here that the power of God is given to us to do the will of God. The power of God is given to us to do, to do God's will and not for what's about to come, which is many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Or did, yeah, did we not? And in your name, did we uh, drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? By the way, this is Jesus talking. So didn't we, didn't Jesus uh, say that we, we, these signs, you know, go out and, and, and in my name, you know, baptize people and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover and all this. These are real things, but we mix this up with the power of God. And Jesus is very clear about this, guys. Do not let men deceive you into believing that the power of God is for tricks. It's not for tricks. When people say, let's have a revival service, you know what that means to many people nowadays? Let's come. Let's have the drums going crazy. Let's be standing there. Let's have all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. I believe that that's what church should look like anyway, by the way. I don't believe that that's what a revival service is. The Bible says that the, that the gifts of the Spirit are for the edification of the body. That should be always in operation, not when you have a revival service, right? So, so, what, so what really is it about? Well, these people seem to think that in this verse, they say, well, Lord, didn't we do, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we perform many miracles? And they have substituted the power and the knowledge of God for tricks out of a bag. Now, does it mean that God doesn't do these things? No, it means God does do these things, but it's always behind the believer not in front of the believer. The believer is not to seek a sign. Jesus said, blessed is the man who doesn't, who believes yet he has not seen, right? So you have to realize that the power of God was given to you to overcome. And these people in this verse that will not go to heaven, they're the ones who actually said, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? Do we not drive out demons, God? Do we not do all these things that mean that we are your children? Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. Here's what Jesus says to them. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Man, I wonder if you fall into that category tonight. I don't mean to say that condemnatorily. I don't. I, I'm just asking. I wonder if you fall into the category of people that are looking for that sign. You see, Jesus said, "Don't you don't don't have don't have a happiness that you have the gifts. Have a happiness that you overcome. Have a happiness that your name is written in heaven." You know, these people here are so excited about their stuff. Their revival services are, bring anybody, God's going to heal. Bring anybody to the revival service. We're going to prophesy. We're going to drive out demons. There's going to be so many miracles in the house. Everything's going to be great. You're going to see God's going to do revival. That's not what revival is. That's not revival. Revival is, the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, and pray and turn from their wicked ways, which means to repent, then I will heal here from heaven and heal their land. I wonder if the Lord has healed your land. I wonder if he's healed you. Has he healed your life and your family and your your you, has he healed you from your addictions? And has he healed you from the, the things that have held you back in your life? Those things that you always complain about, saying that you're, you're not enough? I wonder, you, if it's you tonight, just repent. Stop putting your, 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 hand, your hands on what 
you're going to get out of the deal on the fact that you're going to be awesome because you prophesy. You're going to be awesome because you drive out demons. But do what Jesus said in that previous verse. Be glad that your name is written in heaven and that you're getting to know God because that's what we're pressed forward to, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection. So let's go on here. Um, but man, what a verse. I mean, this literally des describes it right there is that the power of God has been misconstrued in the church, right? Let's go on to a new, another verse here. This is very powerful. And uh, he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. This is, he's writing to Timothy. Paul is writing to Timothy here. And he says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conce uh, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then here's the, here's the point that's really, really, really important because this is all in context. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having a form of godliness, but denying God's power. And then he goes further. Have nothing to do with such people. Have nothing to do with them. I wonder, I wonder why, why people don't actually read this part of the Bible. Because what we see nowadays, especially in the big churches, is the total opposite of that. People have everything to do with people that say that they're Christians, they don't read their Bible, they are disobedient, they're boastful, they're proud, they're lovers of money, lovers of themselves, and they do all these things, they're unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, they're brutal, they're not lovers of good, they're treacherous, they're rash, they're conceited, they love pleasure rather than loving God. Then they have a form of godliness, though. Isn't that crazy? They have this strange form of godliness, but they deny its power. Now, trust me when I say, what, if we go back to that previous verse that we were talking about, isn't that, isn't that the truth when it comes down to it? Isn't that, 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 that the truth? The Lord says, is always saying that same thing. He's saying, you know, you're going to be able to do, you know, maybe you'll heal, maybe you'll do this, maybe you'll do that. And you'll, you'll still think you're good. Well, guess what? If, you, if you're doing these things, <laughs> unforgiving, being slanderous, if you don't have self-control, if you're, if, you're, if you're brutal, if you're, not, if you're um, not, lovers of, not a lover of good, the Bible says love what is good and hate what is evil. So even loving what is evil and loving what is good is actually wrong. The Bible says how can uh, bitter water and sweet water flow from the same well? So you have to realize that you deny God's power when you do these things. So therefore, we can deduce or deduct that the power of God is to basically overcome these things. That's what the power of God is for. Because if you deny God's power, it doesn't say you deny God's power by praying for someone's back to be healed and then it doesn't get healed. That's not how you deny God's power. I've prayed for people's back to be healed and sometimes it didn't, didn't get better right away. Right? But does that mean I'm denying God's power? No. Sometimes that person has a root of bitterness and I can't pray. You know, the Bible says even when the, the people didn't have faith, Jesus didn't do many, many miracles there. And he said to the woman, your faith has healed you. So you have to realize that healing is, is a completely different subject than what the power of God is for. And I'll tell you right now, God wants us to stop denying the power of God. And we need to come to the Lord and we need to say, God, with 100% certainty, your power is going to help me to overcome these things. So here's the, the, end, the end of this whole thing is God has given you power. So he's given you power to believe, right? The Bible says, if anyone must come to God, he must firstly believe that he exists. 
and he must believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So that's a first, the first part, right? You have to believe. You have to have faith. We, we have salvation through, uh, by grace through faith. We have to go through that faith door. Believe. That's why I put that there first. Uh, the second thing is we have the power to love him with all. And that's very powerful because, you know, we realize that some people try to conglomerate these two. Um, and they make it like, well, if you love him, um, then, you know, then um, you'll overcome. But they are, two, they are separate and you can, you can love him and overcome at the same time. But let's not misconstrue those two because there, there are two separate things, right? Paul said, I fight, I fought the good fight or I fight the good fight of faith, right? So yeah, this is not about love, but loving Jesus. And that's, I put that in with all because some people think they love Jesus, but they don't give him all. And that's kind of when we go out and preach, we say all the time, we say, um, he didn't say just love God, love people. He said, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength, right? And then the next one is to overcome, right? So you have to be an overcomer. You have to be fighting um, by the power of the spirit. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, right? And the next, the last one is to love others, right? We have to use the Holy Spirit within us to love others. God will touch your heart. He will bring compassion. The Bible says that Jesus was moved to compassion. And many of the miracles that he did, he was moved to compassion. Um, some people can just say, that, that was just Jesus being moved to compassion. Yes, he was. But he, he also said these words, I only do what I see my father doing. So who do you think um, was moved to compassion? It was the Holy Spirit. It was the spirit of the father that was in him. Remember when the spirit of God descended onto Jesus, he said he it descended from above, which means it didn't come. It wasn't just from Jesus, it was from above, it was from the father. And he said, and a voice came that accompanied the spirit that said, this is my son. So we know that the spirit that was on Christ or the spirit, the spirit, even the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is actually the spirit of the Father. And that's why they're interconnected. It's the spirit of the Father. He says, I don't, I don't do this, the things I see my Father do. Jesus also told us, you'll ask me for nothing. That doesn't mean we can't thank Jesus for his sacrifice. It doesn't mean we can't uh, fellowship with Jesus. But when we're asking, we say, ask the Father. Because all things, all good gifts come from the Father above. So, we have that ability to love people. I wonder if you're struggling to love someone. Um, sometimes there's people in our lives, it's hard to love them. It's hard because they make it hard. It's hard because maybe their attitude is wrong. Maybe they're, they're, they have a, um, a divided attitude towards you. Um, I would just say, you know, love the Lord and love, love him with all your heart. And eventually, out of you loving the Lord, you'll start to find that you're going to start loving these people a lot more. You're going to start to find that it's a lot easier to love these people with an everlasting love that comes from Christ. So I hope that today this encouraged you to understand what the power of God was for. God's power is always present, but don't let us forget the reasons why he gave us the power. Don't lose sight, just like what we talked about earlier. Don't lose sight of the fact that that yes, signs and wonders and miracles will happen around you if you're being a faithful witness, but the power is first to witness and the power is first to overcome and the power is to believe and the power is to love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do my commands and to love others as you love yourself. Guys, be blessed uh, tonight and know that the Lord um, is desiring for you to tap into that power. And don't, don't be tapping into um, any kind of other power. If you go to another place or you meet another person and they start telling you that the power of God is for a certain other purpose other than what this what we've just gone through right now, search your Bible. You'll see what I'm saying is true. God's power is so that we can have our names written in heaven. It's so that we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Go out there. Apply the blood of Jesus on your heart and go out there and tell them the word of your testimony. Tell people how what Jesus has done for you 
and be glad that your name is written in heaven. Be blessed, guys.